online is uh, Professor Michelsen from Jülich. Uh, Crystal, are you there? Yes, I can see you. Yes, good morning. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> so you can start uh, uh, sharing. She will talk about quantum annealing for optimization and classification. Hmm? That is 40 minutes plus uh, five minutes question. Okay, um, when you are ready, I will start. Uh, do you agree with the recording? I mean, it will be... Um... Yes, Okay. Good. perfectly fine. Perfect, okay, good. I'll start in a second. So, can you please confirm that you see my screen? Uh, yes, I see your screen, yes. Okay, perfect. So good morning. So first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to give this presentation here. And unfortunately, I could not come to your um, beautiful place because of other uh, commitments uh, that I had. So I will talk about uh, quantum annealing. So, but as you all know, um, in general, quantum computing has a big uh, potential. And the applications are, first of all, quantum simulations. And then one can think of uh, simulating quantum systems on a quantum computer with applications in quantum chemistry. Then one has optimization. And optimization problems one can find everywhere. So this goes from traffic optimization to also optimization in, in drug uh, design and so on. And as optimization is a first step, uh, usually, in machine learning, an application is also quantum machine learning. And in this talk, I will give you uh, one of our, uh, or actually two, of our works on optimization problems that are solved with a quantum annealer, and also one in the direction of quantum machine learning with classification of uh, images. So first, optimization. We have our DWF uh, quantum annealers, uh, which are the big uh, commercial uh, quantum annealers that are available. And what they do is they are built to solve quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problems, of which you see the uh, mathematical expression here. So we have some problem variables, which are uh, binary variables, taking the values 0 and 1. And then in this expression, we have uh, two uh, coefficients, the bias, which is a real number, and which is here in uh, the single x term. And we have the coupler, which coupler, couples two of these uh, variables, and B is uh, or the Bs are also real numbers. So why might it be interesting uh, to solve uh, such type of problems with an annealer? First of all, uh, discrete optimization is a hard problem. Then, um, second, the annealer can produce many solutions uh, simultaneously, which can uh, lead to a speed up. And another uh, nice advantage is that uh, such a machine is or has a very low energy consumption compared to the traditional uh, supercomputers. So qubits are, of course, uh, connected uh, for the uh, computation. You see this schematically here uh, in this, uh, this graph. So we have here our coefficients a, and then we have the couplers between uh, the three qubits. We have been using uh, lately for our work two types of uh, quantum annealers, two generations, the D-Wave 2000Q and the D-Wave Advantage uh, system. As you all know, both have a different uh, topology of the architecture of their quantum processing units. The oldest one has a Chimera architecture. The uh, recent one has the uh, Pegasus uh, uh, topology. The uh, 2000Q has about 2,000 qubits. The Advantage, about uh, 5,000 or more than 5,000. 
and the number of couplers uh, changed from 6,000 to 35,000. Now, because I was talking here about the connectivity uh, between the qubits, the 2000Q had a maximum connectivity of 6, and the advantage has a maximum connectivity of 15. Now, all these numbers are larger, and uh, this uh, also then results in larger optimization problems that can be solved on uh, the more recent uh, system. So, the uh, chip architectures of uh, the quantum processing unit are then uh, visualized as this graph. So here we see the Chimera graph, here the Pegasus uh, one, which actually includes a Chimera graph, the one here. And uh, all nodes indicated by the blue dots are the qubits, and the black lines are the uh, couplers, which uh, are a result of the connectivity of the hardware. Now, of course, these graphs here, or the architecture of the uh, chip, limit uh, the size and the connectivity of the optimization problems that fits on the chip. And um, we can have problems that do not require an embedding uh, on the chip, but it can, or in most cases, the cubo has to be mapped using an embedding. And uh, then usually we have to use more physical uh, qubits for one uh, logic qubit. But in general, we can say that if we have a cubo, then the variables map onto the qubits and the interactions between the variables um, can uh, be mapped onto the uh, couplers. So recently we have been studying, and, and this is uh, work that has uh, been published, but we did not yet put it on the archive. We have uh, been studying three different uh, types of quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problems. So the first class of problems that we studied um, are two, satisfi two satisfiability problems, and they have a non-unique crown state and a highly degenerate first excited state. This is a class of problems that we have been studying uh, for a long time, uh, because these are problems that are hard to solve um, with um, annealers, but um, the problems are easy to solve uh, with our traditional uh, computers. So in that case, the solution time is of the order of n, where n is the number of variables. Now, when we translate uh, this problem to um, a cubo, then the graph representing the cubo is not uh, fully connected. The second uh, class of problems uh, that we studied are fully connected uh, spin classes, where the values for the J and the H uh, parameters uh, are uniform uh, pseudo-random numbers taken into the interval minus one plus one. Now we know that these are problems that are very hard uh, to solve. On traditional computer. Then, um, by studying uh, these problems and um, putting them on, on the supercomputers to solve them, we have observed that there is um, uh, what we call a fully connected regular spin class model with this type of uh, parameter uh, setting that is very easy uh, to solve. So what we then did is for all classes, uh, we took uh, small uh, problems with up to uh, 20 uh, variables, and we did an exact numeration to find that most 6,037 uh, states. Now, when I say we take uh, small problems, 
Then for the two sad problems, this is uh, more or less uh, the biggest problems we uh, can come up with. It's not easy to find these two sad problems having uh, these properties and finding them uh, requires a lot of uh, compute resources. Then uh, we studied uh, these problems and what we did is we studied uh, the Hamming uh, distance. To, so we looked how many spins we have to flip in order to come uh, to the uh, ground state. And then we have here this distribution of the Hamming distance taking into account the 6037 uh, states. Here you see also the gap uh, between the ground state and the uh, excited states. And uh, what is indicated here is uh, the frequency. Now for these two set problems, uh, we only have the ground states and all the rest are first excited states. So we only have one uh, gap value and then we have a huge frequency. For the fully connected spin class uh, systems, we have this distri distribution for the Hamming distance. We learned from this that it's easier uh, to solve uh, these problems because here the Hamming distance is peaked around uh, five. So in principle, we only have to make, uh, or one could say on average, one has to make these five uh, spin flips. And also the distribution of the gaps uh, looks uh, differently. Then for the uh, very easy uh, spin class model uh, to solve, we have uh, this distribution of uh, the Hamming distance and uh, this distribution of the gap uh, values. Here you also see that we have a lot of gaps that are uh, very small, which with a huge uh, frequency. So then uh, we have used the DWF advantage uh, system uh, to solve these problems and we looked at the uh, success probability as a function of the number of variables. And uh, here we looked into uh, problems with up to 180 variables. And then uh, we get uh, this uh, curve for the uh, success probability. If uh, we look uh, at the uh, curve for the fully connected spin class uh, problem, then uh, we see that uh, for 100 uh, variables, for problems up to 100 variables, we have this shape. And we made uh, some uh, fitting, and then we can compare here the uh, exponents. So here we find 0, 0, uh, 090, and here we find uh, 0, 0,63. So from this, we can understand, and, and, and from these uh, distributions here, that, or we see that there is a correlation between uh, this exponent and these distributions. So this problem is harder to solve than this one on a quantum annealer. Then if we go to this two set problem uh, with the property that it has a unique ground state and this highly degenerate first excited state from which we know already that it's hard to solve on an annealer, we get um, this uh, curve for the success probability. And as you see here, we can only go to uh, problems with up to 20 variables. But you see that this exponent uh, changed to almost uh, 300. So from this, we see that there is a clear uh, correlation. And um, this means, of course, this is for small uh, problems, but um, we have a nice uh, scaling here, so we believe that uh, even if we make uh, these problems uh, larger, we can predict how the annealer uh, will behave 
uh, for uh, these problems. So that was the first um, application for uh, the more, I would say, theoretical type of um, optimization problems. Let me now come to a potential application, which is called the tail assignment problem. This uh, problem is a problem that comes from the airline industry. And uh, when airlines industries see uh, their daily problem that they have about 1,000 flights per day to more than uh, 150 cities and in more than uh, 70 countries. And of course, in their fleet, they have hundreds of aircraft and they are of different types. So then uh, the question in uh, the tail assignment problem is that uh, one has to uh, come up with a mathematical optimization model that when solved can provide airlines with efficient plans for how to use their aircraft. And the most costly um, items are of course the costs that are associated with the aircraft itself, but also with the flight uh, crew. So that are the most significant, most significant costs which one uh, wants to uh, minimize. These tail assignment problems for the airline industry are uh, complex problems. They are also very big. So this means that we cannot solve them with the quantum annealers and quantum uh, computers that we have nowadays. So this means we have to simplify uh, these real world problems. And this one can do, uh, for example, by finding routes to carry out a given number of flights between the airports so that at least uh, the routes do not overlap. And um, the first step in uh, bringing uh, the tail assignment problem uh, to the uh, uh, annealers or also to the uh, quantum computers is uh, we make a mathematical formulation. And actually for the tail assignment problem, uh, this uh, corresponds to a linear assignment problem. What we have to do is we have to minimize uh, this expression, which is subject to this type of constraint. Now, this first expression here is encoding the cost of assigning aircraft to routes. So the factor F uh, contains uh, cost models uh, per route and the X are uh, the routes. Then uh, here we have um, a constraint uh, matrix uh, A. And uh, this expression is therefore encoding uh, the constraints that one has. In this case, we want to have one aircraft for uh, one uh, route. And um, in this constraint uh, matrix, we have elements that take values zero or one, and they simply indicate whether a flight is part of a route or uh, not. We then have this uh, mathematical formulation, uh, which we want to translate into an easing uh, problem. So we go from our cubo to an easing uh, problem by using uh, this transformation, where the x were taking values 0 and 1. The s now takes values plus and minus. and uh, uh, this uh, expression here. Now, here I want to make uh, also the uh, remark that when this value lambda uh, takes uh, the value zero, then we have an exact cover problem. And then the objective of the whole uh, problem is to find 
any feasible uh, solution, not necessarily the optimal solution. And uh, this is something which is uh, very often of interest in practical problems, because there we are not always uh, looking for the optimal solution, but uh, any solution that already reduces the costs is a valuable uh, solution. Here I also want to mention uh, that this type of research, as um, I said before, um, is close to a real-world problem. And it resulted from a collaboration with uh, Boeing in the Open Secure 2 uh, project, which is one of the projects in the uh, European uh, quantum flagship, which had uh, the goal to build a superconducting uh, quantum computer. So, but it's in this project that we looked into this type of uh, problems. In principle, for gate-based quantum computers, but we also solved it on uh, the D-Wave quantum annealer for cross-platform benchmarking. So, we looked at these reduced uh, problem instances, which are exact uh, cover problems. And um, the problems we looked at were a series of realistic problem instances, which were obtained by random sampling from real-world data with up to 40 routes. Now, this random uh, sampling from real-world uh, data is just a step in between because uh, the company Boeing did not, and, and this is understandable, did not want us to um, have a direct connection between the problems uh, we are looking at and uh, their uh, real-world uh, problems. But for the hardness to solve the problems, that's exactly the same. Doesn't uh, matter too much. So I will now discuss one example. We have 40 routes, and each of which contains several out of 472 flights. The question that was asked here is to find routes to carry out all these 472 flights between uh, the airports so that the routes do not overlap. And we studied the problem with uh, 40 routes corresponding to a 40 qubit uh, problem. Now, we looked uh, at the problem instance with uh, one unique uh, ground state, which is then the solution of the optimization problem. Here you see uh, the ground state, which has nine qubits, which have the value uh, one. So we have a solution with uh, nine routes. And then each route is assigned to an aircraft. And all other states that are found represent then invalid uh, solutions, which means that these 470 flights are not covered exactly once which means in practice that these would be uh, solutions that have a higher cost for the uh, airline company. So to give you an idea of how big uh, this problem is, we made a small visualization. So here you see uh, the airports that we took into consideration. Uh, distributed over uh, the whole world. Then we have here the network of 472 flights between the airports that have to be uh, carried out. And here you see the uh, solution with uh, nine routes that cover these 472 flights exactly once. So this is just to indicate uh, to you that this is uh, not a problem uh, that one uh, simply uh, solves by hand, but that it's already uh, a little bit more complicated. 
to give you a further idea about the size of, of the problem um, and, and what the annealer um, has to do or, or what uh, the solver has to do is um, if we have to find this optimal flight shadow so that each flight is covered exactly once for 40 routes, we have 40 qubits. So uh, we have here to 10 to the power 12 possible selections. If we make our problem bigger, if we scale it up to 120 routes corresponding to a 120 qubit problem, then we have 10 to the power 36 possible selections. So it scales uh, very rapidly. Now, we have uh, translated uh, this problem, making use of this uh, constraint matrix. And this is nothing else than this uh, table here, where um, the uh, rows in the matrix represents uh, the roots. So we have here a matrix with 40 roots. And then we have as columns the uh, flights. And what is indicated in blue here are uh, the roots that are uh, parts of the uh, optimal uh, solutions. So this is this uh, matrix uh, with the zeros and the ones. And uh, we have to see uh, that the sum here of the rows is um, exactly everywhere a one. Um, here I show you the coupler graph um, and each non-zero uh, value for J corresponds to a black line between uh, the 40 qubits. So, so you see that the problem we are solving here is an almost uh, fully connected problem. And this fully or almost fully connected problem needs then to be embedded on this uh, DWF architecture, which is far from uh, fully uh, connected. And uh, here to just give you an, you an ID, I also uh, give you the uh, distributions of the values of the uh, easing uh, parameters uh, for this problem. So uh, we solved first problems with uh, 30 to 40 qubits, where we have 90% of the couplers that have values that are non-zero. What we did, we made a scan of 10 different embeddings and uh, 20 relative chain uh, strengths. We used the uh, 2000 Q with the Chimera graph to solve these problems. And uh, as a comparison, we also used uh, the um, advantage system with the Pegasus architecture. And we, or I show you here results for 30, 36, and 40 uh, qubits. What you see here is the success rate as a function of the relative chain uh, strength. And uh, what you see is that um, the, for 30 qubits, of course, the success rate is uh, quite um, high. For 36 uh, qubits, this reduces already uh, strongly on the uh, Chimera system less on uh, the Pegasus. For 40 qubits, we have a low um, success rate on the Chimera graph, but still a very reasonable one on the um, advantage system. So we then took uh, the best embedding and chain strength and made a scan of the annealing time for uh, the different uh, problems with different uh, size, uh, qubit sizes. So observation is success rate increases as the annealing time is increased. But uh, for the larger uh, qubit problems, we see a clear um, 
advantage on the um, advantage uh, system, which uh, is represented by the blue uh, line. We then also studied uh, larger problems with up to 120 uh, qubits. And uh, these problems are larger, but they are sparser because only 20% uh, of the couplers are uh, non-zero. Then uh, we looked at the fastest successful runs that uh, reproducibly uh, gave a solution. So here you have the QPU access time as a function of the number of uh, qubits and uh, the success rate as a number of qubits uh, for the two uh, different uh, systems. And we see that from this picture here, the advantage system, as uh, one can expect, can solve uh, larger problems uh, than uh, the uh, 2002 system. It also solves the uh, problems uh, faster. But if the uh, 2002 can solve a problem, then uh, we observed that uh, sometimes the uh, success rate is higher than uh, solving it with the advantage uh, system. And this is uh, something which we have observed uh, regularly also for other types of optimization problems. Now, these are results uh, for the quantum annealer. Um, it's always good, and because we were studying this problem um, in the context of a project uh, that was developing a um, um, gate-based system, it's also good to do cross-platform benchmarking with optimization algorithm on a gate-based system. And there we know we have the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, which is designed for this. As a word, uh, or this type of quantum algorithm is a variational algorithm, and it's also hybrid, meaning it's consisting of two parts. One part, which is a quantum algorithm, and in this case, uh, the quantum uh, quantum algorithm has to evaluate uh, the energy expectation value of a quantum register. And the second part of the algorithm is a classical one. And this is an optimization algorithm, which uh, has to optimize parameters for unitary transformations, parameterized unitary transformations that are used in this uh, quantum part of the algorithm. Now, because gate-based quantum computers suffer from a lot of errors and because they are still relatively small, um, for the comparison here, we did not use a real uh, device, but we used an emulator which runs on a supercomputer. And for this, we used a GPU uh, version of the universal quantum computer simulator. Now we took the quantum algorithm and uh, let it carry out by the GPUs of the Joule's booster. So in this case, the GPUs then play the role of the quantum processing units. The classical optimization algorithm we gave to the CPUs of the Joule's booster and uh, the problem we studied was uh, the tail assignment problem, the simplified version, which I have been talking about before. And here we can only look into the problem with uh, 40 qubits. Why? Because the combination of this emulator on uh, the uh, dual system limits us to uh, calculate problems with up to 43 qubits. Here you see uh, the results, the success rate as the number of qubits, 
we can calculate the success rate because for these problems we know the uh, exact ground state and the blue triangles are the results of the um, quantum approximate optimization algorithm the standard version as uh, you might all know what we see here is an uh, exponential decrease of the success rate as a function of the number of qubits which is a bad uh, message because what we have been doing here is solving this problem with um, uh, what one could say an ideal digital uh, QPU because we solved uh, with the help of the quantum computer emulator on the dual system uh, this optimization uh, problem. Now, we were not satisfied with these results, and as we are also looking into algorithm de developments, the, we asked ourselves the questions, can we improve this? And uh, we then came up with an approximate quantum uh, annealing algorithm, which is a new algorithm, which is better uh, than Kaioa, at least for this uh, problem set, in the sense that we got rid of this exponential decrease. You see, the success rate is still low, but at least we got rid of the uh, exponential decrease. And then for your information, I also give uh, once more uh, for comparison the results which we obtained with the annealer. So for the 2000 uh, Q system, we found a success rate of uh, 10% um, for these problems. Then we put the identical problems now on the annealer. And for the advantage system, we found a uh, 70% uh, success rate. I also want you to show you some uh, results about uh, classification. And for this, we have uh, put a uh, version of the support vector machine on the uh, quantum annealer. So we went from classical support vector machine to a quantum support vector machine. And a support vector machine is a supervised machine learning method for binary uh, classification. So one starts from a given uh, training set, which contains uh, feature vectors and uh, labels. And uh, the support vector machine is then uh, trained by solving uh, the quadratic uh, programming uh, model, where the alphas are continuous uh, program variables, and we also have a kernel uh, k here, which uh, depends on, on uh, this uh, theta features. And then we have also some uh, constraints here. Now, on the DWF annealer, we solve Kubo problems. These are also quadratic uh, problems, but there we don't have uh, continuous uh, variables, but we have uh, binary variables. So this means we have to uh, make an encoding from uh, uh, or two uh, binary uh, variables from the alphas to the binary variables. And uh, for this, uh, we use uh, this expression with the base and the exponent. We then uh, come to a new um, energy uh, expression for uh, the cost evaluation. So we have here our uh, familiar Cubo uh, formulation, if we make this translation. Now, we, uh, as a first application, uh, we used a toy model with toy uh, data. The point or, or uh, the uh, toy model is the following. We have a set of points, a set of 40 points, and uh, the question is to uh, make a distinction between uh, 
uh, the inner points and the outer points. Now, here you see the uh, solution with the classical support vector machine. We get uh, this uh, black uh, line here. So these red points are in distance close to each other. These blue uh, ones are uh, further away uh, from each other. So property of the classical support vector machine is uh, that one gets uh, the global uh, minimum, but this is only uh, guaranteed uh, for uh, the training uh, data. Then we put the same uh, problem on the uh, quantum annealer, and then uh, we get several solutions. And here you see uh, three of the solutions that we get uh, by running or by let the annealer solve the problem. This first solution resembles very much the one of the classical support vector machine. And these ones um, are different and uh, they uh, take into account different properties of uh, this data. Uh, so uh, this one, for example, takes uh, more into account uh, the distances between uh, the points, uh, the outer points. So we can say what we have here with the quantum support vector machine, we have additional higher energy classifiers from an ensemble of uh, solutions. Now, what we then do is we uh, combine uh, these uh, classifiers and uh, this gives them, uh, or what we have seen is that this can give uh, better results. Why can this give uh, better results? That it's because it's taking more properties of uh, the data sets uh, into account. We then have applied this to a problem of uh, computational biology. And for this, uh, we looked into the problem which is described in, in this paper here. Uh, this was a classification problem. And the question was whether transcription factors uh, of the protein bind to uh, DNA or not. And um, here you see uh, results which we obtained by a uh, classifier with the quantum support vector machine here with the uh, classical support vector machine. And what we uh, observed is that, and this is typical, with the quantum support uh, vector machine, we have an ensemble of uh, solutions at one shot. The uh, combined uh, classifier, so if we take several of those, generalizes well to unseen data, so not the training data. Um, the issue here is that we can only do this uh, up to now, of course, only for uh, small data sets. So the problem size is uh, still small. And we must say that um, if we look at, into other problems uh, or other applications, it's also so that uh, combining these classifiers does not guarantee that one uh, comes to a better result. For this application, yes. Uh, for other applications, uh, not always. So this is not uh, guaranteed. Chris, so, sorry, I think we should um, move towards the conclusion. Yes, so as a conclusion, I want to show this uh, last application, uh, which is a classification of uh, remote sensing data. What you see here is a picture which shows a part of the city of Lyon. It's a false uh, color picture. We want to make binary classification. So here you see the ground truth. Red structures are the buildings. Uh, the black uh, are all the rest. 
Here you see the classical support vector machine uh, result and uh, the quantum support vector machine uh, result. So in this case, you can also see there is quite some uh, good uh, agreement uh, between uh, both pictures. We can even say that in this particular case, uh, the quantum version gives a better version uh, than the classical one. And what we are doing uh, right now, and that's work, work in progress, is to do a multi-class uh, classification of this type of Earth observation uh, pictures. And with this, I would like uh, to conclude uh, our research overview. Thank you very much. Chris, so time for a few questions. Daniel. <clears throat> Hi, I actually have a question. Yes, please. Um, at the start of your talk, you said that um, when you were talking about this having distance between the spins, you said that you flip a few spins to change between chiralities. What do you mean by chirality? Um, I was not talking about uh, chirality here. So what I was talking about, um, uh, if you have uh, your uh, states, then they are represented by uh, these bit strings. And uh, you can calculate uh, humming, what the humming distances is between uh, two states if you do these uh, spin flips. So I was not talking about chirality. Oh, okay. Actually, I also have a question about uh, the uh, this effect of this relative chain strength and embedding. I mean, how does this different embeddings and what is exactly this relative chain strength and how does it affect the embedding? Um, it's, um, we have uh, certain embeddings and uh, then we can look at the, um, oh, and therefore I, I, it's better that I share again uh, to give you the um, expression for the um, relative uh, change strength. So I can also do it like this, it's, it's faster. Um, so here you have this relative uh, change, relative chain uh, strength. So it's uh, the chain uh, strength which is divided by the maximum of the absolute values of the uh, values H and, and J. And um, one actually has to uh, to play um, uh, with, so what we do here, we have uh, different embeddings and then one plays with uh, the chain uh, strengths uh, for, for the problems. And then you see that you have uh, different uh, success rates. So this chain, uh, relative chain strength is also a parameter uh, just as the annealing time is to solve your um, problems. Thank you. That's answer. Hi. Um, yeah. Uh, could you go back to slide six, please? I, I will here take full. Yes. Yeah, so I. Uh, Okay, we, we were on that slide, uh, number six. Yes, I wanted yeah. to make it full screen because uh, this might be. So the, the question I had about it is uh, simply, did you uh, optimize the anneal time or did you, did you change the anneal time even uh, in order to deduce the exponents that you were showing there? Because the exponents are uh, 
probably pretty sensitive to um, optimizing the annual time. Um, yes, as um, I would say, as always is the case. So um, the um, success rates are a an, 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 uh, function of, of these parameters uh, and yield time and also this uh, relative change trend. Um, so um, what we do here is um, we look at um, best values. So, so we make a test and then we look at uh, best values. But I no, do unfortunately not know by heart uh, uh, this. Now we are here, yes. So I, I would have to look um, it up. I do not know uh, by heart what the um, annealing time was uh, to come to these uh, success uh, probabilities. But we take long enough uh, annealing times and um, relative uh, chain strength. So we first make some optimal there. Okay. Um, and then I, I had a general question about uh, many of the results that you presented. Um, in, in, in some cases, you, you found these uh, impressive uh, success probabilities, for example, in the tail assignment problem. Um, but quite generally, did you try to benchmark your quantum results, whether um, on D-Wave or the simulation of uh, QAOA, versus the best-in-class classical solvers for the same problems? For example, for a tail assignment, I'm, uh, I imagine that airlines have invested a lot into um, uh, really good uh, classical heuristics. And, uh, and so how do the results compare to best-in-class classical solvers? Um, these are um, problems, uh, at least the size of problems we are looking at, uh, that can be easily solved on, on um, supercomputers. Even if, if this, um, so that's no competition. So, and that's also not um, the goal of the work that we were doing here. So that's uh, for us, uh, for this type of problems we were looking at here, that's a given. So our question was, uh, can we put uh, these problems onto these uh, quantum computers and what does it mean? And what does it mean if we do a cross-platform benchmarking between different types of uh, quantum computers? So it's not that we claim here any uh, so far uh, quantum uh, advantage in looking into uh, these problem sizes. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think we have to move, so let's thank uh, Crystal again. For <laughs>